Good morning, friends. Will you please rise for our opening prayer? Let us fold our hands in front of our hearts, close our eyes, take the attention within, with all the peace and calmness and devotion of our hearts. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, Father, Mother, Mother, Friend, Friend, Beloved God, God, Jesus Christ, Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Lahiri Mahashay, Swami Sri Yukteswar, and our Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, we bow to you all. Beloved God, fill us with the love and thanksgiving that overwhelm the heart of a newly awakened saint. Give us the fervor known to all true devotees who have ever loved and found thee. Om. Peace. Peace. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. In Self-Realization Fellowship, we always begin our inspirational services with a period of devotional meditation and chanting. Anyone here for the first time today or new to Self-Realization? Okay, just a couple. Very nice, nice to have you with us. Welcome. So before we begin our service, like I said, we begin our services with a period of meditation and devotional chanting. And the purpose of meditation is to still the body, to calm the mind, so that we can, at least for a short time, forget the world, forget all our cares and problems and responsibilities, and take the mind within and calm it down enough so that we start touching our true nature as the soul, as a spark of the infinite. And through that calmness, through that awakening of soul consciousness, we become more intuitive. We become better equipped to cope with our problems, with our challenges, and to live life more joyfully, more intentionally, being more present every moment. If you do not have techniques of meditation, you can simply keep your eyes closed, Lift the gaze gently to the point between the eyebrows, the seat of concentration and willpower in the body. And just that practice will make us more peaceful and calm. And then you can also talk to the infinite spirit, talk to God, whatever aspect that you relate to, the creator, the infinite cosmic consciousness, Talk to that spirit, talk to the divine in the language of your heart. Let us assume the correct meditation posture. Keep your spine erect, away from the back of your seat if possible, shoulders back, chest out, abdomen in, hands with the palms upraised, resting at the junction of the thighs and the abdomen. Feet flat on the floor, neck held back in line with the spine, chin parallel to the floor, eyes closed gently with the gaze lifted to the point between the eyebrows, the Christ consciousness center or the Kutastha Chaitanya center. Keep the body relaxed. The more we can relax the body, the more we can go in quickly.
Before we practice meditation, we will begin with a devotional chant to awaken our hearts, to awaken the feeling aspect of our beings and to also help us concentrate the attention. Chant is very simple, one of the cosmic chants composed by our Gurudev Paramahansa Yogananda. It's a chant of divine yearning expressing to the Divine our need to realize our oneness, to have a vision, to realize our nearness with that Divine Spirit. In the valley of sorrow, a thousand years or till tomorrow, I'll wait to see you you, just you. My heart's aflame, my soul's afire, just for you, you, just you. So as we chant this together, forget everyone around you. It is just a conversation between you and God, expressing your heart's devotion through this chant. In the valley of sorrow, a thousand years or till tomorrow. In the valley of sorrow, a thousand years or till tomorrow. But I'll wait to see you, 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 just you. My Lord, I want to see only you. My heart's a flame, my soul's a fire. My heart's a flame, my soul's a fire. Just for you, 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 just you. My Lord, I want to see only you, 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 just you. In the valley of sorrow, a thousand years or till tomorrow. In the valley of sorrow, a thousand years or till tomorrow. But I'll wait to see you, 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 just you. My Lord, I want to see only you. Just you. My heart's a flame, my soul's a fire. My heart's a flame, my soul's a fire. Just for you, 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 just you. My Lord, I want to see only you. Just you. In the valley of sorrow, a thousand years or till tomorrow. In the valley of sorrow, a thousand years or till tomorrow. But I'll wait to see you, 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 just you. My Lord, I want to see only you. My heart's a flame, my soul's a fire. My heart's a flame, my soul's a fire. Just for you, 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 just you. My Lord, I want to see only you. You, you, just you. 
My heart's a flame, my soul's a fire. 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 Just for you, you. My Lord, I want to see only you, 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 just you. My Lord, I want to see only you, 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 just you. My Lord, I want to see only you.
Good morning, friends, once again. It's a real joy to be with you. I've always enjoyed coming here to meditate, to participate in the inspirational services, chant with you all in our kirtans, and also to enjoy spiritual fellowship with all of you. The topic for today is a, is a lovely one. It is titled, How Devotion Reveals the Invisible God. It's a very wonderful and vast topic on which our Gurudev Paramahansa Yogananda has given us immense wisdom. And it is impossible to cover the gamut of this very rich subject in a 25-30 minute talk. But uh, I hope that we can at least touch upon some of the key points this morning. So before we jump into the subject, I would actually like to start with a little story. And this story is from the life of Bhagavan Krishna, Lord Krishna. And for those of you who are new, Lord Krishna is the one with the crown on the altar, a great prophet from ancient India. And he is the one who gave the wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita which is the most revered scripture in India and perhaps in many parts of the world. So, Bhagwan Krishna was sitting with his, some of his disciples next to a river, a river, a flowing river. And the disciples were just sitting peacefully at his feet, enjoying the peace and the calm, and just being with their guru. After some time, one of the disciples ventured a question. He said, Lord Krishna, can you explain to us what true devotion means? How does a devotee, how does a true devotee really practice devotion? And Krishna was always interested in helping his disciples understand some of these spiritual concepts. So he told the disciple, why don't you go to the river and pick up a pebble from the river bed and bring it to me? So the disciple obeyed, he brought a little pebble, gave it to Krishna. And Krishna said, see how this pebble is wet on the outside. And he said, now you break this pebble in two. And so the disciple got a big stone and broke the pebble in half. And Krishna said, see how the pebble is bone dry on the inside, even though it was wet on the outside. He says, this is like those devotees who are coated with devotion on the outside, coated with love for God on the outside, so long as they are in a spiritual environment, so long as they are in ideal conditions. But the moment they are removed from that spiritual environment, all the devotion evaporates. Even on the outside. And inside has always been unaffected, dry the whole time. And so the disciples are listening intently, trying to absorb the wisdom of Krishna's words. Then Krishna got up, he went to the river, and he dipped the hem of a silk shawl into the water. And he brought it back to the disciples. And he said, see how these threads are completely soaked even to the point of dripping. This is how most devotees are. They are saturated with devotion, dripping with love for God. But the moment I take my shawl out of the water, the wind will dry it. And in some time, there will be no sign of any water or devotion. So similarly, these devotees when they are surrounded by godly activities, when they are in spiritual company, when they are meditating, praying, worshipping, they are saturated with devotion. But the moment they are sent back into the world, into the real world, that devotion evaporates. And the disciples were listening intently trying to fathom what their guru was telling them. What was he going to do next? So after the disciples had assimilated that wisdom, 
Krishna gave a lump of sugar, a block of sugar to one of the disciples and he says, go and throw this in the water. So the disciple did that and then after a minute Krishna said, go and fetch it. And the disciple went and looked everywhere. Obviously the, the sugar had dissolved in the water, it was nowhere to be found. And Krishna says, that is how a real devotee is. He dissolves, he or she dissolves their ego in the Lord. There is no more separation between me and you. It is all one. And that devotee is most pleasing to me. So we could end the service right here. I mean, <laughs> that in a nutshell captures what this topic is about. I mean, you think about it, it's very profound. Devotion means utter self-forgetfulness, where there is no thought of self, where God is the only reality, where the devotee sees nothing but God in creation. Every living thing is a manifestation of God. All work is God's work. And there is no ego. There is no separateness anymore. The devotee dissolves himself or herself in spirit. So you see, devotion is a state of consciousness. It is not something that we just, when we meditate, we practice. And then when we get up, we are done with devotion and we go back to life. That's not how it works. It is a way of life. It is a state of consciousness. And it is very different from emotion. Devotion is different from emotion. People sometimes get confused. Devotion is to convert love for God into spiritual action. It takes action based on the feeling in your heart. The devotion, the love that we feel in heart, the emotion that we feel has to be converted into spiritual action. That is devotion. It permeates our whole consciousness. It permeates our life. Just like Jesus said, right? Why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? The calling Lord, Lord is the emotion part, right? Oh, I love you. That is emotion. But what are you doing about that feeling? Do the things I say. That is devotion. Now, how do we accomplish this? We have to play our roles in life, our, fulfill our duties in the world, play the drama with full enthusiasm and attention and spirit, and yet, at the same time, have the thought of God constantly in our minds. Like that lump of sugar that dissolves in the water. The thought of God is permeating our whole life. There is no separate time required for communion. There is an internal communion happening all the time. It's hard to accomplish, you know, that is the ultimate state of realization when one can perfect that practice where the thought of God is predominant in one's consciousness no matter what one does. But it takes time, it takes effort, it takes work, but it is absolutely worth it. The spiritual rewards are worth it. Now, Guru Paramahansa Yogananda says that devotion is really the ultimate in the spiritual path. Because that is the only one thing we can offer the, offer the Lord freely we cannot win God by reason, we cannot win God by intellect. Because our wisdom, our reason, our intellect is very, 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 very small compared to cosmic consciousness. We are a product of an intelligence inconceivably big. That's what Guruji says, inconceivably big. And so we cannot reason our way to God. Our wisdom, our intelligence comes from Him or that spirit. So what can we offer? The only thing we can offer God is our love. Because the 
highest wisdom is love the highest wisdom is love and the indian scriptures say that when a true devotee really offers god his or her love god becomes the servant of that disciple isn't that sweet god becomes a servant of that disciple waiting at the beck and call of a true devotee what do you want i'm here to help you just like jesus washed the feet of his 12 11 disciples i should say one of them betrayed him during the last supper he washed the feet of his disciples he became their servant and he was representing what god does for the devotee when the devotee has an intimate sweet relationship with the divine and when we are in love with someone like another human being we are filled with enthusiasm and just uh, just uh, wanting to do the best in everything right for that individual isn't that so imagine if we can feel even a particle of that love that we feel for that other individual for the divine for god how beautiful life could become because we will be filled with enthusiasm and love every moment because we want to do the best for god now devotees can sometimes confuse devotion as a sign of weakness especially in the west with men devotion expressing one's love for god can be seen as a feminine thing or you know a feely touchy thing oh it's not you know men don't do that <laughs> but on the contrary devotion is actually a sign of great strength and power if one knows how to practice it correctly think of our guru paramansa yogananda how great was his devotion and do you think of him as a weak individual he was one of the most powerful men who lived on this planet right so devotion is has nothing to do with weakness it is a very very strong quality now i had the blessing of growing up in india where this quality of devotion is inherent in the culture i mean i don't know how to express it it's is part of the dna and one doesn't even think twice it was only when i stepped out of the country i realized what i had gained uh, growing up in that culture and especially in rural india which has still uh, been protected from all the the vices of modern life to a large degree it is getting there unfortunately now but still there is a purity there is a simplicity there is a devotion that the people have that is just remarkable remarkable and i will tell you a little personal story of my experience with this this happened many years ago i was a day scholar meaning i was living at home with my parents i was going to engineering college in delhi and i had a study room at home in my apartment uh, which had a desk and i used to study there over the weekends and uh, free time and so forth and that study room also served as a dual purpose it was also the worship room the puja room for our family and my mother had a lot of pictures of saints and deities indian deities on the wall so if this was my desk the wall was on the left and you know, all the pictures of the saints and the great masters were there and on my right was a large window that opened into a courtyard and that courtyard led to the outside into a lawn so one afternoon i was studying there at my desk and my mom used to have periods of inspiration she would just come in into the room and start chanting facing the altar she would be chanting to to you know her ishta her concept of the divine in sanskrit you know she knew a lot of sanskrit mantras so she would just start pouring out her love in that form and uh, i was very used to that so it didn't bother me i was just studying and from the corner of my eye i saw somebody had come walked into the courtyard and was standing outside the window and looking in and i didn't lift up my head to see who it was i just kept studying but then after a few minutes i saw saw the person was still there so i looked up and i saw this man who was a very simple fellow who had just come from a village a few weeks ago to provide assistance to the maintenance staff in that colony that we lived in you know he used to just do 
uh, odd jobs, you know, for the plumber, for the electrician, he would just assist them. Uneducated, illiterate, you know. And he was standing there looking in at the altar, and he was just seeing the back of my mother, and he was just hearing the chants, and tears were just streaming down his eyes, and he was, had his hands folded. And I can assure you, this man knew nothing about Sanskrit. He didn't know what my mother was chanting. But something had touched his heart. And he came from outside. You know, he heard my mother's chant. He came, walked in into the courtyard, and he was standing there, just, just in simplicity. He didn't, you know, he, he wasn't trying to impress anyone. That, that is bhakti. That is devotion. So how do we express devotion in meditation? Like we discussed, devotion means utter self-forgetfulness. There is only one thought of God. There is no thought of self. And our Guru teaches us that we first practice in meditation the scientific yoga techniques to calm the body and mind. And once we are calm, then we sit in that stillness and that peace for as long as possible. And then after that, we offer our love, our devotion to God. But how do we do that? We take a devotional thought and repeat it mentally over and over again in our minds, visualizing whatever concept of God that appeals to you in your spiritual eye and repeating that thought I love you, Divine Mother. I love you, Divine Mother. Or, Father, make me realize my oneness with Thee. Father, make me realize my oneness with Thee. And Guruji says, you know, even the word Father, that is enough. You don't even have to say the rest if we can really go into that spirit. And our former beloved President, Sri Dayamata, shared this one time, it's actually in the book, Finding the Joy Within You, in the chapter, Heart of Flame. She wrote, I have often told you about Gurudeva's ecstasy in God, in 1948, when he repeatedly uttered only one word. He didn't say God, God, because even in that, there is a sense of distance from God. He repeatedly uttered only, you, you, you. What a thrill went through us with that one word. Now one can test one's quality of devotion in meditation. And (laughs) the way you do that is when the time comes to express your devotion, from time to time, be aware of how much our thought is on ourselves and our problems and our needs. <laughs> Lord, help me with this. You know, I have the, my boss is troubling me or you know, whatever your issue may be at any given point in time. Versus how much your thought is completely on God alone. It can be a very humbling experience, I can tell you from my own personal experience how much of the time my mind is often on my problems and myself rather than on God. And you know, it's perfectly fine to express to God our needs. We want to have that kind of a sweet, intimate relationship with God. There's nothing wrong with that. But let's make sure that we reserve at least some portion of that meditative period, of that devotional period, to think of nothing but God. No thought of self, no thought of our problems. You, you, you. That's what we want to do. I'd like to read to you a little excerpt I came across just yesterday from Mahatma Gandhi. Now, Gandhi was, as you know, a great social reformer. He was a saint, no doubt, and he derived his strength for social transformation from his inner relationship with God, through his practice of prayer. And listen to what he says. Gandhiji said, True meditation consists in closing the eyes and ears of the mind to all else 
except the object of one's devotion. Emptying the mind of all conscious processes of thought and filling it with the Spirit of God brings one ineffable peace and attunes the soul with the infinite. We should make a serious effort to throw off the attachments of the world for a while, to make a serious endeavor to remain, so to say, out of the flesh. The practice of complete withdrawal of the mind from all outward things, even though it might be only for a few minutes every day, will be found to be of infinite use. Imagine, you know, a great political leader, he's saying true meditation consists in closing the eyes and ears of the mind to all else except the object of one's devotion. I would like to read to you an excerpt from the book Autobiography of a Yogi from the chapter The Heart of a Stone Image. And this is one of my favorite chapters in the book because whenever I go through a dry phase in my own spiritual life, I usually pick up this chapter and read it and every single time it brings me out of that dryness and awakens a spark of devotion in my heart. And for those of you who have not read the book, I know a couple of you are new, I'm not sure if you've read the book, but just to set the stage, uh, because I'm going to read only an excerpt from this chapter. So Guruji was a young man growing up in Calcutta, and he, his eldest sister, Roma, was a very devout uh, devotee. But her husband, Satish, was extremely materialistic. Uh, he derided her spiritual practices, he derided saints, and you know, he just didn't want anything to do with it. <laughs> so one day, Roma, in tears, approached our guru, and asked him if he could help, help transform her husband so that he doesn't remain so materialistic. So Guruji promised her, and he came up with a plan. He said, you know, the three of us, tomorrow morning, we will go to the Kali temple in Dakshineshwar, just very close to Calcutta. And he felt like in the spiritual vibrations of that holy, holy place um, may bring about some transformation in Satish. So that's the stage. So they arrive early morning at the temple, the three of them by horse carriage. And I'm going to read to you this excerpt. And I would suggest that you please close your eyes and visualize what is happening as I read to you Guruji's words. I proceeded alone to the portico that fronts the large temple of Kali, God in the aspect of Mother Nature. Selecting a shady spot near one of the pillars, I sat down and assumed the lotus posture. Although it was only about seven o'clock, the morning sun would soon be oppressive. The world receded as I became devotionally entranced. My mind was concentrated on Goddess Kali. Her statue in this very temple in Dakshineshwar had been the special object of adoration by the great master Sri Ramakrishna Paramahansa. In answer to his anguished demands, the stone image had often taken a living form and conversed with him. Silent mother of stone, I prayed, thou didst become filled with life at the plea of thy beloved devotee Ramakrishna, why dost thou not also heed the wails of this yearning son of thee? My aspiring zeal increased boundlessly, accompanied by a divine peace. Yet, when five hours had passed, and the goddess whom I was inwardly visualizing had made no response, I felt slightly disheartened. Sometimes it is a test by God to delay the fulfillment of prayers. But he eventually appears to the persistent devotee in whatever form he holds dear. A devout Christian sees Jesus. A Hindu beholds Krishna or the goddess Kali. Or an expanding light if his worship takes an impersonal turn. Reluctantly, I open my eyes and saw the temple doors were being closed, were being locked 
by a priest in conformance with the noon hour custom. I rose from my secluded seat on the portico and stepped into the courtyard. Its stone surface was scorched by the midday sun. My bare feet were painfully burned. Divine Mother, I silently remonstrated. Thou didst not come to me in this vision, and now thou art hidden in the temple behind closed doors. I wanted to offer a special prayer to thee today on behalf of my brother-in-law. My inward petition was instantly acknowledged. First, a delightful cold wave descended over my back and under my feet, banishing all discomfort. Then, to my amazement, the temple became greatly magnified. Its large door slowly opened, revealing the stone figure of Goddess Kali. Gradually, the statue changed into a living form, smilingly nodding in greeting, thrilling me with joy indescribable. As if by a mystic syringe, the breath was withdrawn from my lungs. My body became very still, though not inert. You can open your eyes now. You can read the rest of the chapter in the book, and you, you see how the story unfolds and how Divine Mother does indeed transform Satish. Yeah. Some years later, he became a saint, Guruji says. Now, the point to remember in the story is that it took steady perseverance, concentration, one-pointedness by Guruji, who was a spiritual master to begin with. It took him five hours to convince the Divine Mother to appear to him. Right? You know, I love when he says, my mind was concentrated on Goddess Kali. The world receded as I became devotionally entranced. Nothing else existed for him, it was only Kali. But we don't need to get discouraged because God loves all of us equally. God has no favorites. The saints have made the effort to open their hearts to receive God's blessings. But we too, even though our devotion may not be as great or as pure as that of the great masters, but through our sincerity, our determination, we will, in time, attract the divine attention and make that invisible God visible through our devotion. So how to cultivate devotion? We talked about how to practice it during meditation, but like we discussed, it is a, it's a way of life, it's a state of consciousness. It's not, we finish meditation and that's it, no more devotion for the rest of the day. Guruji says that we have to maintain a constant devotional attitude toward God, constant devotional attitude. And it takes work, it takes time, it takes zeal. But like we discussed in the beginning, it's absolutely worth it because life becomes a divine romance. Like Guruji says, becomes a divine romance. So number one, constantly reminding ourselves of the need for God in our lives. Constantly keeping that in mind, because we know the reason we are all sitting here is because we know that the world is powerless to give us that unending joy that each one of us is seeking. We have to go within. God is the only thing that can give us that. So constantly reminding ourselves, I need God, I need God. Because the world will do its best to make you forget that purpose. Two, regularity in the practice of the scientific techniques of meditation as taught by our Guru. Because Guruji said, Kriya Yoga plus devotion works like mathematics, it cannot fail. Guruji said, sitting in the silence trying to feel devotion may often get you nowhere. That is why I teach scientific techniques of meditation. Practice them and you will be able to disconnect the mind from sensory distractions and from the otherwise ceaseless flow of thoughts. Very important. The science of yoga. Third, practice the presence of God throughout the day. Chant something in your mind. Om Guru, I love thee, Lord. 
reveal thyself. Whatever it is that appeals to you. Every now and then, bring your mind back. Practice the presence. Practice the presence of God. Four, offer all activities to God. In the midst of our activities, just take a, a minute, a 30 seconds, 15 seconds, and just inwardly say, I offer this to you. I do this for God and Guru. I do this for God and Guru. When you do that, sincerely, what happens is, somehow, karmically, your actions are no longer binding. Because you're not doing it for yourself. You're making an offering to God. And good or bad, those activities, those actions cannot bind you through karma. Five, spiritual study. Take something from, something inspiring from Guruji's writings, from some spiritual literature. Spend a few minutes every day reading, studying. Six is watch your environment. Watch your environment, inner and outer. Watch what you are reading, watch what you are watching. Because each thing that is going in through the senses, through the eyes, through the ears, is going to revolve in your consciousness, whether you like it or not, good or bad. So make sure that you keep your consciousness pure, as pure as possible. Number seven is devotion can actually be cultivated through willpower. If you're feeling dry, if you feel like, oh, I, I'm not a devotional person, I, I, this is not my thing, you can use willpower to cultivate devotion. Visualize some inspiring story, like this story that we just read, or something else that awakens your, your love, your feeling, and visualize it. Go through it in your mind, and you will feel love. And lastly, pray to feel more love for God. It's a legitimate prayer to ask God to bless us with more devotion, with more love. So in closing, I would like to read to you this very beautiful poem by Guruji from Whispers from Eternity. It's called Heavenly Heart. I hunted thee in the forest of consciousness. And for those of us for whom English may not be the first language, heart, H-A-R-T, means a male deer, a stag. So Guruji in this poem has, gives a very beautiful visualization. He's comparing God to a deer. And we as a devotee are pursuing, chasing this deer, because we know we want that, we want that God. And how we try different things through our ignorance, and it only pushes that deer farther and farther away. And what at the end actually draws that deer to come to the devotee. So just close your eyes and again visualize this as I read to you Master's poem. Guruji says, Clad in the hunter's green of selfish desires, I pursued thee in the forest of consciousness, O divine heart. The sound of my loud prayers startled thee. Thou didst swiftly flee I raced after thee, but my erratic chase, the hue and cry of my restlessness, caused thee to retreat still farther. Stealthily I crept toward thee with my spear of concentration, but my aim was unsteady. As thou didst bound away, I heard in the secret echoes of thy footfalls, without devotion, Thou art a poor, poor marksman. Even when I held firmly my meditation missile, thine echo resounded, I am beyond thy mental dart, I am beyond. At last, in submissive wisdom, I entered the silent cave of selfless love. Lo, thou, the heart of heaven, Camest willingly within. Om Guru Jai Guru. Let us now take a couple of minutes to pray deeply 
for those who have requested physical, mental or spiritual help. Let us also pray for world peace and harmony, for those suffering in many parts of the world. And then a couple of minutes we will rise and practice a healing technique. Let us please rise. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing presence in their bodies. Rub your hands together rapidly, visualizing the cosmic energy collecting in your hands and then raise the arms and chant om om heavenly father thou art omnipresent thou art in all thy children manifest thy healing presence in their minds Rotate your arms rapidly around each other, visualizing a ball of cosmic energy collecting around your arms. Om. Heavenly Father, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing presence in their souls. Om. Let's chant Om once more for world peace and harmony. Om. Let us pray together, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Mother, Mother, Friend, Friend beloved, God, beloved God, Jesus Christ, Jesus. Bhagavan Krishna, Krishna. Mahavatar Babaji, Mahavata Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswar, and our Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, we bow to you all. Heavenly Father, Mother, may thy love shine forever on the sanctuary of our devotion. And may we be able to awaken thy love in all hearts. Om peace. peace. Amen. Amen.
This concludes our service. God and Gurus bless us always.